Hey everyone, my name is Shannon Schilling with Analytical Graphics. I'm here today with John Carrico and Mike Laux from Space Exploration Engineering and Cody Short, also from AGI. And we're here to talk to you today about leveraging cislunar flight experience to enable the US Space Force to monitor and plan in domain operations. All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the motivation and the recent developments. So I'm Cody Short. I am an astrodynamic software engineer here at Analytical Graphics. I'm also the product technical lead for our Astrogator uh, module in the systems toolkit. And so as we've been developing a lot of the, the capabilities of Astrogator, uh, we've also been keeping our, our minds and, and eyes open with respect to a lot of the things that have been going on in kind of the developing lunar and, and cislunar regime. And so with respect to that, we've been giving a lot of a lot of thought to what's been going on over the past, you know, number of decades, what people have been doing in these areas. And so for example, if we go back a little while, uh, or several years ago, one of the things that one of the first trajectories that actually uh, flew and, and didn't actually originally intend to use the moon the way that it did uh, was the AsiaSat-3 mission. And so this is one of the first missions that ended up exploiting uh, the, the lunar gravity to influence its trajectory in such a way that it was able to do something that it hadn't originally intended to do. And so this is a, a mission where the, the satellite was put on orbit and, and due to the way that it was injected into its orbit, it wasn't put into the proper orbit. And so um, the, the designers wanted to, to get it back in place and figure out how to do that, but they didn't really have enough fuel to do it. And so over the course of using some, some very ingenious planning and being able to use some natural resources available to them, the gravity of, of the moon, they were able to use the multi-body dynamics that were available to them to be able to influence the trajectory and actually became the first commercial use of lunar gravity to influence the trajectory of, of a spacecraft. And we're able to actually take the AgeSat-3 satellite and put it back into a, a useful orbit. So that's one of the, the first examples of a mission that was exploiting these dynamics. And so if we step forward a little bit, to around about 2010, we have an example of the Artemis mission where we had the spacecraft that were the Themis spacecraft um, that were studying various effects of the sun. And they were in high elliptical orbits about the earth. And several of them were getting towards the end of life and were very low on fuel. And the, the mission designers, mission planners said, hey, we could potentially do some more things with these. And so, Basically, being able to uh, exploit the, the lunar dynamics associated with them, the, the multi-body lunar dynamics, they were able to take this, these spacecraft with very little fuel and design an extension on, of that Themis mission, which then became the, the Artemis mission. And so this is different than the, the current Artemis mission. They were able to take two of those spacecraft and use uh, orbits in and about like the L1 and L2 points in the Earth-Moon system and actually get these spacecraft from these highly elliptical orbits, and they actually you know, send them out further um, and kind of use some solar dynamics as well. And then it eventually pulled them in and put them into orbit about the moon after several revolutions about L1 and L2. So this was actually one of the first uses, was the first use of the lunar uh, multi-body dynamics in the Earth-Moon system. So it was a very interesting and exciting example there. And then very, much more recently, we have this commercial application with Bearsheet from Space IL. So in the last couple of years, the first commercial mission to actually land on the moon. And so here, the spacecraft we wanted to take and, and get it to the moon. And so taking the spacecraft out into the cislunar regime, using the, the cislunar dynamics to be able to, to phase it in such a way to get it to the moon and then to, to land there. And so this again is another first, but another mission going to the moon. And in this particular case, by a, a commercial entity from another nation, and then, of course, uh, recently we've also heard a lot about another country flying spacecraft using and taking advantage of the multi-body dynamics in the Earth-Moon regime. In this particular case, uh, this is from the Chinese Chang'e 4 uh, mission with their Kuikau satellite, their, their relay satellite, which is in orbit about the lunar L2 point. So it's a relay satellite being able to give them coverage on the far side of the moon. And so just very relevant to us and kind of the discussion that we have today of the sorts of things that are going on and what we're trying to, to kind of talk about. There's more and more going on in the lunar and cislunar regime each day. 
so much more going on. Um, we have several more missions coming down the pipe, uh, Lunar Flashlight, Lunar Ice Cube, Lunar Trailblazer, we all have like a common theme here, a uh, Lunar H-Map, the Capstone missions getting ready to fly soon, Artemis, of course, and uh, a recent comment or a recent note from the, the Amos conference was that there are about 100 upcoming lunar missions that are planned over the next about 10 years. And so lots of things going on in the lunar, cis-lunar regime, um, lots of things that are very relevant to being able to, for, for us to be able to, to understand what's going on. And in each of these missions, because of the nature of the, the highly perturbed dynamics associated with the, the orbits that, that fly in and or fly near the moon, um, they become very perturbed with the motion associated with flying near there. They all end up exploiting these multi-body dynamics approaches and then having to consider the, the things that are being imparted by the moon. And so it's, it's a situation where we start to end up with trajectories and behaviors and orbits that might not be as familiar as things that we, we may have been familiar with in the past or that some of our folks that have supported missions in the past may not have been quite as familiar with. So that actually takes us into the next thing that we want to talk a little bit about. And that's how some of the things, some of the orbits, some of the approaches that we have used in the past might require a little bit of a change of perspective as we move into looking at some of these things, some of the, the missions coming down the pipe, some of the missions right now and understanding them. So for example, in this, in just in this transition slide, you have several orbits here in the Earth Moon system. And these orbits are things that may not look familiar to a, a lot of orbital analysts. You know, if you're familiar with, uh, say for example, the three body problem, they may be familiar to you, but they're different looking um, shapes. Um, for example, you have families of orbits here that, that just kind of look different. They don't look like your typical elliptical orbits. And that's part of this process when you have to take and adapt the approach that, that maybe you've had traditionally being an orbital analyst from a perspective of looking at things in perhaps uh, low Earth orbit or at geo, and perhaps now transitioning into a cislunar space and starting to look at things that are not necessarily in the same reference frames as you may have looked at things before. All right, so for example, here in this animation, we see a distant retrograde orbit, which is shown in the, in the rotating reference frame in, in like the gold path but we also show it in the uh, inertial reference frame in the purple path. And the purple path shows us a, a what may look more familiar, it may look more like a perhaps highly perturbed elliptical path as it's getting pulled around by the moon because we're out near the moon and the moon is really working on this orbit. And so we can see the different perspectives that we have here. And the, the different perspective that the rotating frame view gives us, well, we see a very nice closed orbit in the rotating frame as compared to that from the inertial frame where we see this highly perturbed view. And then we, we see a different orbit here, a near rectilinear halo orbit, which is one that is a candidate orbit or the orbit that's been selected for, for the Artemis gateway mission. And we see actually in the inertial frame where the orbit may actually not be as familiar as kind of like that highly perturbed elliptical orbit but now we see something that it might actually be more advantageous for us to look at it from the perspective of the of the rotating frame view where we see an orbital motion where we see a closed path or something close to a closed path so just having these different perspectives and, and a perspective that may not be as familiar to to us or to, or to a particular analyst as something that may be a, a perspective that previously from like a, a leo or a geo perspective these different tools and these different approaches it gives us different different perspectives and, and different ways to look at the problem. And so then here we have both orbits looked animated together. On the left-hand side, we, we have similar views as to before, and on the right-hand side, we, we just have the rotating frame view. Yeah, and I think um, for folks who have worked on geo missions and LEO missions, um, they're familiar with looking at orbits both in inertial and then on the ground track, um, because those are useful, those missions. And the ground track is actually a Earth-fixed rotating frame. So that that is kind of the state of the art in looking at LEOs and GEOs. And what we're showing here is that instead of a ground track, uh, the Earth-Moon rotating frame is the thing that is helpful. That becomes the thing that really helps you look at the mission compared to your mission requirements, it helps you look at the trajectory compared to the mission requirements. And then inertial, um, the inertial view is, of course, tells you more about the overall dynamics and observability. And 
can help you figure out, well, when does your inertial mental model work and when does it break down? And I think that's one of the things we're um, trying to help people with is how to develop the useful mental models for different phases of the mission. And when a mission first launches, we actually do think of it in terms of inertial, but by the time we capture into some of these um, cislunar periodic orbits, there's a change of coordinates that the, a, a different mental model is helpful. Thanks, John. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead then and uh, hand this off to you, John, uh, and to you, Mike, uh, and let you guys talk a little bit then about some of the things that you guys have done. Thanks, Cody. Yeah, as, as Cody mentioned before, on the um, AsiaSat-3 uh, HGS-1 rescue mission and um, actually with the bearer sheet, the Space IL bearer sheet lunar lander, those are good examples where the technology and the skill sets had already been developed to fly lunar missions and to fly gravity assist missions um, in support of NASA, actually uh, supporting NASA missions like on uh, Clementine and the International Solar and Terrestrial Physics Program. And we had that, te that technology and we had that skill set and then we commercialized the software, which became Navigator and then uh, eventually became uh, the software Astrogator. So when it was needed for the rescue mission and when it was needed for commercial, it was already available already had been tested, all of that risk had been bought down, um, it was operational software, and we had uh, teams of folks who were who were skilled um, in uh, flying these missions. So um, so I think that's, that's one of the things we're seeing with um, helping uh, the Space Force now, is that we, we've got some very mature technology and very mature skill sets that have already been used, uh, have already been paid for mostly um, by NASA. But now it's uh, readily available for kind of the challenge of, of this new cislunar um, uh, space domain awareness. That's right. And the, the missions that have been supported, as John mentioned, the, some NASA missions, the WMAP mission in the early 2000s, and then by the, by the late 2000s, in 2008, IBEX flew, which was a, a NASA mission, but operated commercially. And that was a three to one resonant orbit that went three quarters of the way to the moon, around 300,000 kilometers and higher at Apogee. And then LCROSS and LADEE were both lunar missions that flew in 2009 and 2013, uh, respectively. And then the test mission, which flew out beyond the moon and then came back and got into a resonant lunar orbit. Um, the Space IL mission in, uh, in 2018 that flew to the moon and then uh, attempted a landing. And then many missions after that, supporting the CLIPS missions and, and the commercial rocket lab uh, photon upper stage launches. So the technology and the software has has progressed over the last 20 years to really, you know, supporting uh, NASA missions and now, you know, commercial and international missions that are on the way to the moon and, and have been already been to the moon and operated there. So it's a very mature technology and a very mature set of tools that have been used, um, you know, both in analysis and in operations. And this is just a list of things that uh, the, the people in our company have supported and we consider it a, um, a body of knowledge. This is a body of knowledge that has that we've learned We've applied in analysis and operations, and we think you know this body of knowledge can now be transformed and uh, presented to to support all these new missions that are going. There's no reason to reinvent this stuff. This is a very high tier level. It's operational. One of the things that's um, particularly interesting to me about supporting all these different missions is that they are numerically chaotic. They're very very sensitive to initial conditions, so that the techniques that we've um, helped it develop and you know we've obviously worked with a lot of other people on this um, but the techniques that we're using and, and have helped develop are methods to control chaotic trajectories the cool thing about that is with a chaotic trajectory some very tiny maneuvers can really affect and steer you back the problem with that is some very tiny errors or maneuver uncertainties or uh, tracking uncertainties can take you way off so there's a um, a, a different method of looking at these trajectories than I think we see when we support GEO or LEO. If you have a problem in low Earth orbit or geostationary, you do your best, you can go home, think about it, have some meetings the next day in the conference rooms and come up with a plan to save it. When you're in the cislunar world and you're um, trying to get to the moon or to get to um, libration point, you're on a very, very tight timeline because you will um, you can come off your ideal trajectory to a point that you uh, don't have the delta V authority to get back on the trajectory. So in, in designing these trajectories, we really have to take into account how we can navigate these things. How do we track them? How do we plan maneuvers to get back? And we have to manage our uncertainty quite a bit. And so there's different tracking schemes that impacts the schedule. We have to take a look at the communications parameters and make sure those will match the, um, the mission. And we, we won't choose a mission that is too risky. We'll add extra loops 
we'll uh, put in times to calibrate the engines. We'll make sure that we can understand the uncertainty in the position and velocity as we predict before we pull off a maneuver. So that's, um, it's been very exciting and it's very challenging, but again, that's what we consider a body of knowledge that already exists, um, is how to handle these very, very sensitive uh, missions. All right, so just a few slides focusing on the software aspect. AGI is a commercial software company and we've been developing software for the aerospace and defense industry for over 30 years. Specifically, Astrogator, our trajectory design and maneuver planning tool. You'll see in this chart some of the missions, and they're across every orbit regime, um, that it's been used in operationally. And focusing on the rightmost columns, uh, cislunar, deep space, you'll notice there's a strong correlation here with the missions that John talked about earlier. We have a long partnership with SEE, and they've been using Astrogator and its precursors for over 25 years now. And this is just really important because the software having been used operationally for so long and in so many different missions, it's tested and proven, which really lowers the risk when you're planning these complex cislunar trajectories. And similarly, our Orbit Determination Toolkit, ODTK, has been used operationally all over different orbit regimes as well. So whether you need to simulate OBS to verify your tracking and scheduling is meeting your OD requirements, or um, maybe you need to be able to process a variety of traditional or non-traditional observation types, the fact that this software has already been used in cislunar and deep space regimes can really help lower cost and lower risk in these types of missions. So we've really just been focusing on the trajectory design and orbitology aspect of planning cislunar missions. But I just wanted to touch on all the other pieces that are equally important. And of course, all of these are interconnected and tie back to the trajectory work. So as a quick example, in trajectory design, maybe we're using uh, solar electric propulsion. And in that case, we would need to make sure that we're avoiding eclipse times when we need to be thrusting. If we're planning our maneuvers, we may need to have sufficient tracking beforehand so that the maneuver can be correctly planned. And we may need tracking afterwards in order to calibrate the engine. So a lot of the things shown here feed back, and it's really an iterative process of redesigning the trajectory, going through the complete systems engineering process, and making sure you're meeting requirements. And that's really our specialty with our software, is being able to tie all of these pieces and models together in one design reference mission, so that when something changes, all of those relationships and outcomes can be modeled together. And that's what we're calling digital mission engineering or digital mission operations. And the more we can tie all of the interrelated systems together, and model them end to end, the more effective our system design or mission operations will be. All right, thanks Shannon, Mike, and John. I just wanted to, to add a few concluding remarks here. So essentially, we've seen that there's increased interest and activity in the lunar and cislunar space, both for civil and military applications. And that's really kind of driving this need for persistent awareness for us, for, for the Air Force, for the Space Force, to be able to monitor and understand these activities. And those activities often represent fundamental shifts in kind of the understanding as kind of the relevant approaches have largely been in the, the domain of academia up to this point with the, the different types of orbits and, and the different ways that we would analyze and approach the system or space types of trajectories and such. The previous missions that, that have flown to these areas have significantly relied on the body knowledge of subject matter experts uh, for success in those areas. And in that process, there's been significant investment, both uh, from commercial uh, entities and, and from the government, to develop that body of knowledge, to develop software applications, and and to fly missions, and, and represents a high TRL level of, of success in flying missions. And so a goal here is then to transfer this experience directly and through specialized application extension, an extension of that software uh, it represents a powerful option for supporting our national interests in cislunar space. So thank you.